is permanent ridges or the ridge till. Careful, careful cultivation and planting, and the use of cover crops which eliminated the need for herbicides. <coughs> Today, not only are their, their costs about $100 or more per acre less than their neighboring chemical farmers, but their yields on their beans, oats, and hay are actually higher and are only slightly less on corn, with half the level of soil erosion. They also have healthier livestock and sleep easier at night not worrying about their own health than using the Cargill open systems. And um, have been able to really uh, have a very healthy um, uh, pig population. The success of the Thompson farm is a testament to a growing force in agriculture. It is known by many names, including organic, biological, ecological, alternative, natural, and regenerative agriculture. What all these different names have in common is the concept of sustainability, of an agricultural system designed to last. For this reason, they can be referred to under the umbrella term of sustainable agriculture. Sustainable agriculture is a positive response to the limits and problems of traditional and modern forms of agriculture. It is neither a return to the past nor an idolatry of the new. Rather, it seeks to balance the two. In the words of farmer poet Wendell Berry, a sustainable agriculture is one that depletes neither the people nor the land, and I would add the animals. For an agriculture to be sustainable, it must be ecologically sound, conserving natural resources and not harming the environment or our health. And here you see subterranean clover sown along with the corn, and that's a way of providing nitrogen as well as shading out weeds and uh, crop providing better till and also conserving moisture. Second, must be economically viable, giving a fair return to the farmer for his or her labors. And we think that it's also important that we take care of the hidden costs and subsidies in the system as well. Third, it must be socially just, assuring full participation, equitable access to the land, and fair wages for all workers. We think that the increasing economic concentration both uh, large farms as well as uh, what's taking place with agribusiness uh, is leading away from this kind of social justice. We're also concerned about access uh, by, to farming by young and new farmers, uh, as well as the role of women and landless people. And finally, the agriculture must be humane, uh, respecting all living things as well as one another. And we'll be addressing this a little bit more in a few minutes. It must work with nature while utilizing the latest scientific advances. So here's something that's been a traditionally used by farmers, for example, in Asia and the Philippines, Azola, which grows in symbiosis with a blue-green algae, actually fixes nitrogen, it takes, this ni takes nitrogen from the air and makes it available to the rice. So this is one of the things we can use instead of synthetic fertilizers, which contaminate our water um, and cause other problems with the soil. We can use these and uh, actually have healthier crops and save money at the same time. Second, we want to have integrated self-reliant and resource-conserving agricultural systems. Many of the animal-based systems throughout the world actually use biogas, uh, uh, where, in, for example, the pigs, the manure is collected and used in this methane gas or biogas digester. Uh, it's one way of dealing with the global warming effect because methane is one of the greenhouse gases. It's also a way of protecting our trees because instead of cutting down the trees, the gas uh, can be used for cooking, just like natural gas burner, as well as for lighting the home. And then the waste from the digester is put into this fish pond where uh, the fish will feed off the waste and then can be harvested. And then the, uh, uh, the sludge from the bottom of the pond can be put back on the field. So it's a way of conserving our resources. Whether or not it's an animal-based system, we do need to have more integrated systems. And the goal is really to have systems that are productive now and in the future. Using organic farming practices, for example, in India, they're able to get yields which rival Green Revolution yields um, completely organically. The truth is sustainable agriculture just makes good sense. As the U.S. Department of Agriculture said in the 1980s study, most organic farms are productive, efficient, and well-managed. Many of the current methods of soil and crop management practiced by organic farmers 
or those which have been cited as the best management practices for controlling soil erosion, minimizing water pollution, and conserving energy. And it was exactly the work by farmers such as Dick Thompson, whose farm you see here, Sharon Dick Thompson's farm in Boom, that actually led to this report <coughs> called Alternative Agriculture, which was released just a year ago by the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences. This is our top scientific body in the United States. And this study was led by John Pesek, who is here at Iowa State University. And it's a very important study. If you haven't seen it, it really documents that alternative agriculture can produce yields that are equivalent to very successful farmers, can produce yields that are equivalent to, if not superior than conventional agriculture, at far lower costs. Unfortunately, one of the weak parts of the study was really is dealing with animal-based agriculture and the need to make it more humane. And that's something I hope that there will be another study about. Now what I'd like to do is, um, is to talk and go to another part of the world. At the same time as Dick and Sharon Thompson were proving the benefits of sustainable agriculture, a similar story was taking place many thousands of miles away on the other side of the world. Gordon Jarrett was one of the first farmers in Australia to embrace chemical agriculture. And he was a loyal convert until the day his doctor told him his health was in serious jeopardy from chemical exposure. Suddenly, Gordon was faced with the choice of giving up his farm or finding a new way of farming. He changed to a more sound crop rotation, and he began recycling nutrients through composting and replaced synthetic fertilizers with natural ones such as manure. What makes Gordon Jarrett's story more interesting is that the farm right next door to his belongs to his brother Eddie, who you see on the right on the tractor. And since converting to sustainable practices, Gordon's yields had continued to rival his brother Eddie's while his costs have actually decreased, and both stocks of farms are the same size, a thousand acres. Not only has his health improved dramatically, but so has the health of his organically raised sheep. As indicated by the lambing and survival rates, which are 20 to 30 percent higher than others in the region, through their sharing the sheep, they find that uh, their, their animals are much healthier. This is something we find with organically raised animals around the world, that the veterinary bills are far less and the animals are much healthier. Contrary to what you might expect, changing over to a sustainable agriculture did not mean more work or hiring more people. Aside from some seasonal help, the entire thousand acres are farmed by Gordon and his daughter Denise, including a large and beautiful organic orchard. Sustainable agriculture is proving itself to be a viable alternative to the wasteful and dangerous practices of conventional agriculture. And now what I'd like to do is actually turn to some other parts of the world and go to Europe. And this is in Switzerland. Um, and look, for example, where traditionally farmers such as Jan and Claudia Schwab uh, have raised their goats uh, organically and in a very humane way. Um, this is sort of the traditional practice amongst many of the farmers there. But this man, I wonder if we could get that. This man, Dr. Detlef Polsch, was actually responsible for a revolution in Switzerland. Uh, what he did was, He's a scientist at the ETH, the Federal Institute of Technology. And he, along with other top scientists at that institute, as well as other researchers around the country and animal rights organizations, actually, a little over 10 years ago, uh, brought about the creation of the first uh, uh, federal laws in Switzerland on the humane treatment of farm animals. And one of the things that they were, he's an expert in poultry sciences and humane treatment of, of, of poultry animals. And I'll show you an example one of the systems that he developed, changing away from the battery cage tents, which were producing a significant proportion of the uh, eggs that were in Switzerland to a more humane kind of system. One of the places uh, where some of these practices are being put into place is at this cantonal school at Edinburgh. Uh, this is a school uh, where farmers are taught organic farming. It's actually a college for organic farmers, not for students, but for farmers, where farmers actually leave their land to take some classes on a part-time basis and learn about organic farming. And they have developed some of the most sophisticated animal husbandry systems um, that you can find in Switzerland. Um, in terms of both uh, the pasture management with uh, tremendous diversity of grasses that the animals are being fed, as well as this system that was designed by Dr. Detlef Folch, uh, where you see, uh, instead of battery cage tents, 
free range hens that actually have access to this uh, caged and pasture area. They can do dust bathing if they like, and then they can eat various grasses in a diverse pasture. And then they have two sheep or more. It will help to keep the grasses down. Um, and in this system, they have several hundred uh, hens uh, that will come out, and then they have the laying uh, shed, which you can see here a little bit more up close. And uh, these are the kinds of systems now, which are we're finding more and more in place. And by the year 1991, there, there are not allowed to be any more battery caged hens uh, in the country of Switzerland. Um, also, one of the things that more and more farmers are doing are using Chinese weeding geese. Uh, this is very common in China, where they have the geese go through the field. <coughs> and they eat various weeds um, instead of the crops. And uh, so it's a great way to do natural weed control. They can then get the meat from the animals as well as the waste from the animals to help fertilize the soil. Um, well, Switzerland has not gone as far as we feel it really needs to in terms of eliminating concrete um, in terms of its uh, pits. What they do allow it, uh, here at Evenring is that they have uh, uh, allowed the families to stay together. So there will be several, several families of pits um, being together. <laughs> this is uh, also in Switzerland. Uh, this is Heinz Peter Schuter at He's the head of an organization called COG, which is the Consumer Working Group. And uh, this organization was founded about 15 years ago uh, by a woman named uh, Leah Erlemann. And uh, she had been an artist and a housewife who was very concerned about the uh, inhumane treatment of badly caged hens. And uh, she started doing a petition um, and spread it throughout Zurich, was interviewed, and then created an organization called COG. Uh, which now has over 10,000 members, and they have developed humane standards for the treatment of farm animals. And Hans Peter is holding a uh, wrapper, a certification wrapper, that they put around their eggs to certify that they have been humanely uh, raised. And uh, right now, they represent about 1% of all of the egg production in Switzerland, although it's growing fairly quickly. Uh, this is Dr. Erwin Kessler, who's with another environmental group who's trying to enforce the Swiss laws, and he feels that uh, it's very difficult right now. Many of the farmers have not changed their practices significantly, um, particularly in terms of their hog production. And he feels that about one third of the farmers um, are actually following are, are actually following the law. Now this is a market where some of the humanely raised animals are being sold uh, as meat. Uh, the reef market. I'm sorry, this is out of focus, but I just want to show this poster um, of one of the farms, and it describes the farmer's systems. Now, one of the kinds of meat that this KH group uh, has produced is something called Porco Fidelio, and that's their, their brand name, and it means pork with a good life. That's its translation. And here you see the butcher with the pork. Um, this was uh, spun off by KEG, this consumer group, as an independent profit center, so it's now its own organization. And there are now about 150 places, stores, uh, that are selling Porco Fidelio meat. That still is a small percentage, only about half of 1% of the meat that's being sold. Now, here's a woman selling KEG uh, eggs, the free range eggs. Um, and it's one of about a thousand stores that are in Switzerland that are selling these kinds of eggs. They produce about 12 million eggs a year, which represent about 1% of the Swiss consumption of eggs, and that's about a $4.8 million market. There is another organization which actually has about 3% of the market. It's called Gourmet Meat Hearts, or Gourmet with a Heart. And it's run by the uh, a Swiss umbrella organization for animal protection which is made up of all the animal protection organizations. They have lower standards in terms of what humane means. They basically follow just the federal law. Uh, the KPG standards are much more strict, and ho hopefully the federal standards will be increased and be in compliance with KPG standards. And uh, just one picture of some of the problems that are going on with animal-based agriculture in Switzerland. They're having tremendous uh, contamination of their lakes. 
uh, with die-offs of all the fish in their lakes from the manure running off from their uh, dairy cattle. And so there probably will be restrictions, actually, not probably. In all around these lakes, actually, they have restrictions on the numbers of animals that the farmers have. Now I'd like to go to Sweden. Um, this is uh, Dr. Paul Holtenius, who's uh, at the College of Veterinary Medicine. He's a veterinarian uh, at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Sciences. And it was very interesting having a discussion with him. He's one of many eminent scientists, and not particularly known for his views on humaneness, but just a typical uh, scientist. And when I described to him about veal production practices in the United States, he looked at me in horror. He couldn't believe it. He said, we stopped doing that 15 years ago. We realized that when you raise uh, veal and the meat is white, that that's an unhealthy, sick animal. And no one would want to eat that kind of meat. So now the Swedes just don't eat uh, veal. And uh, so he was just amazed. At, and as we went through the Swedish law, which was just passed a few years ago, the most wide-ranging law on animal protection in the world, he just was astonished about how backwards we are in the United States. And particularly, he was concerned about the views of his fellow scientists in the United States. Because in Europe, almost all the scientists, it's not even a question that animals have feelings, they have normal social behavior patterns that need to be exercised. This isn't even an issue. But for most of our scientists here in this country, it's a big question. So I think we have a lot to learn from scientists such as, such as, as he and others. And I understand actually that there's a delegation of scientists from here from Iowa State University that went to Europe this year to talk with some of their scientists. I hope there'll be more of an exchange because they really are doing some far-reaching important work. And this is the organization, Ani Malin, which really led the effort to get the Swedish law passed. Uh, as many of you know, the author of uh, 50 Long Stockings was responsible for really pushing it. And this is one of the leaders uh, of the movement, Christina Oden, with her book on uh, natural uh, hen keeping uh, in Stockholm. And so they were the ones that really pushed very hard for the law. I just wanted to show this picture. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get all my pictures back. I just returned from Sweden and Switzerland. So some of them did not come back. But these calves were just born. And what's important about this uh, Swedish farm, farmer is that he feeds his calves first before taking any milk. And that's a very unusual thing for farmers in this country where we separate them right away. And uh, I think that their laws on having open pasture being required for their cattle is a very important step. Uh, this is some of their organic milk that's being sold uh, that follows very, very strict regulations by K, uh, I'm sorry, by Crop. that's the uh, Swedish Organic Farmers Organization, their certification organization, with standards that are much tougher even than the Swedish national law, combining both organic and humane treatment of animals. And uh, here are some eggs as well as some milk that come from Denmark. Denmark also passed a law on humane treatment of animals. And one of the great things also about their law is that they actually provided an incentive, financial incentive, for farmers to change over to organic practices, which means that they also will have to follow the law in terms of human treatment. Now I just wanted to close with uh, just a positive, another positive farm. This is uh, the Cayenda farm. Um, and you can see that the uh, cattle in the background, and the Swedes really have a deep love for animals, all types of animals. And here you can see that they're grazing both cattle along with their sheep together, including uh, black sheep, which is quite pretty. And unfortunately, I didn't have all my other pictures about pigs, but these were the few that I did have. Um, they uh, actually have their pigs on pasture, which is uh, very common in Sweden. And this is the pig shed with their son, Linus. And, uh, what I think is, it, I, I have to say, I've never seen happier pigs in my life, um, as they can wallow and exercise their normal social behaviors, uh, including brooding behaviors, uh, and really turning over the soil. And many of the farmers use them as a way of turning over the soil and preparing. And uh, uh, it, it's really, it was amazing just watching that, the natural behaviors. 
So just a nice closing picture of uh, Linus with the hit. And there are a number of other Texas systems that we're using. I'd be happy to answer questions about those. I'm sorry I don't have the photos. But again, just to come back to the earth. And uh, just I hope that these will give us some positive altern alternatives to look towards. And uh, that we really can create a sustainable future that pass on to the next generation. Thank you.